by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, a sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand, this gospel offends Rome today, they offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. I'm Tom Press, and I'll be guest hosting for the next two hours. The first hour we'll spend in our continuing reading and discussion of the book Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy. And at the end of the hour, we'll have discussion and field questions from the listeners. Last time, we concluded on page 344 in the book, and I'll retreat to page 343 and continue with the paragraph that we concluded with last time. Remember, we're talking about the New Testament predictions of the Protestant Reformation. That's right, the New Testament scriptures predict the Protestant Reformation. Remember, there was to come first, before Messiah comes, there was to be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. That is the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. But afterwards, there would be a reformation, a return to the scriptures rather than the traditions of men. And that's what took place at the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation came about because the Bible, for the first time since the falling away, The Bible, for the first time, had been printed in a language that the people could understand. And they read it for the first time in their lives, and they realized from the reading of the Scripture in their own language that the papacy, that the Roman Catholic Church, was that falling away. And they repented, and they liberated nearly all of Europe from the clutches of the tyrant on the Tiber. Now we'll continue with the uh, first full paragraph on page 343. Henry Grattan Guinness writes, The pious Brykenet, Bishop of Mao, sent a copy, that is a copy of the scriptures, to the sister of Francis I, urging her to present it to her brother. Quote, this from your hand, added he, cannot be agreed, cannot, can but be, uh, excuse me, cannot but be agreeable. It, speaking of the scriptures, it is a royal dish, unquote, continued the good bishop, quote, nourishing without corrupting and curing all diseases. The more we taste it, the more we hunger for it with uncloying and insatiable appetite, unquote. Quoting again, he says, the gospel, wrote Lefebvre in his old age, is already gaining the hearts of all the grandees and people and soon diffusing itself over all France. It will everywhere bring down the inventions of men, unquote. And what are these inventions of men? 
Roman Catholicism, the great falling away. It continues, the old doctor had become animated. His eyes, which had grown dim, sparkled. His trembling voice was again full-toned. It was like Simeon thanking the Lord for having seen his salvation. Farrell, the French reformer, maintained the sole sufficiency of the word of God as the rule of faith and the duty of returning to its use. In the great Protestant confession of Oxford, it is by a simple reference to Scripture that the new doctrines of the Reformation are justified. From first to last, from its incipient germ in the soul of Luther to the crowning day of the Reformation, the Bible was the very heart and core of the movement, and Protestantism has since deluged the world with Bibles. Do you wonder then that prophecy makes the giving of a, quote, little book open, unquote, to the representative of the church at that time a leading feature of its prefiguration? But you must note next that this was not the only thing given to John by the mighty angel. There follows a great commission which he was to execute. He who of old had said to his disciples, quote, Go ye into all the world and proclaim the glad tidings to every creature, unquote, renews this commission to John in his representative character and says to him, quote, Thou must prophesy, and by that he means preach again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, unquote. It is a second sending to the world of the gospel message, a second appointment of witnesses to proclaim the glad tidings. So it's literally talking about the Protestant Reformation. And it says, and this was needed, for the fundamental ordinance of gospel preaching had long fallen into disuse among the Romanists. Remember, the Roman Catholic priests didn't preach the gospel. The only thing the Roman Catholic priest did was serve Mass and take confession. The traditions of men had absolutely nothing to do with the preaching of the gospel. That's why when the Bibles first became readable in men's native tongue, they were shocked and appalled that the priests behind the pulpits in the Roman Catholic Church never read to them the gospel. They had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Roman Catholic Church. Again, it says, and this was needed, for the fundamental ordinance of the gospel preaching had long fallen into entire disuse among Romanists. The preacher had been lost in the sacrificing priest. In other words, no preaching was done. They only made the sacrifice of the Mass in the Roman Catholic Church. There was no knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone. And it says the people had for ages, uh, excuse me, the people had for ages had none to break to them the bread of life. That's right. The priests of the Roman Catholic Church did not break to them the bread of life. They simply broke the Jesus cookie, the sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church the Mass, the Host, the Eucharist. It's meaningless. It's an idol. It has nothing to do with Christ. And that's what the, that's the realization that was brought to the Protestant uh, Reformers as they read the Scriptures for the first time. They'd literally been taught another Jesus. They had never known the Jesus of the Bible. And they had never heard his gospel before. Very few of us in our day and age can realize what really was the state of affairs during the Dark Ages. But they were called the Dark Ages for a very good reason. There was no light in the world. All there was was Roman Catholicism and priestcraft. The traditions of men, the great falling away. They had silenced the gospel by allowing it only to be read in in Latin and then only by the priests. And they were never given the truth. Now, continuing, he says, Luther. Now, remember, it was Martin Luther who translated the scriptures from Latin into the German language. 
so that the people for the first time in their lives could read the scriptures for themselves and hear and read the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, Luther shrank at first from the office of a preacher, but it was forced on him by circumstances. After he had finished his translation of the book and returned from his seclusion in the Wartburg, he began to publish the truth from the pulpit as well as from the press. Quote, it is not from men, he wrote to the elector, that I received the gospel, but from heaven, from the Lord Jesus. And henceforth I wish to reckon myself simply his servant and to take the title of evangelist. Unquote. In other words, preacher. He began to preach in an old wooden hall in Wittenberg, and soon the largest churches were thronged to hear him. Within two or three years, the gospel was being preached as well as read all over Germany and in Sweden, Denmark, Pomerania, Livonia, France, Belgium, Spain, and even Italy, and also in their own isle. Bilney had procured a copy of Erasmus's New Testament and found comfort and saving light in its study. Quote, then, he said, the scripture became to me sweeter than honey or the honeycomb, adding, as soon as by the grace of God I began to taste the sweets of that heavenly lesson, which no man can teach but God alone, I begged the Lord to increase my faith and at last desired nothing more than that I should so be comforted of him, excuse me, that I being so comforted of him might be strengthened by his spirit to teach sinners his ways, unquote. Renouncing the Romish title of priest and doctor, Martin Luther, in a treatise against papal orders, styled himself simply, the preacher, and the Reformed churches provided for a continuance, not of sacrificing priests, but of gospel preachers. Quote, in the Popedom, says Luther in his table talk, they invest priests not for the office of preaching and teaching God's word, for when a bishop ordaineth one, he saith, take to thee power to celebrate mass and to offer for the living and the dead, meaning offer the Mass for the living and the dead. That was the end-all and be-all of Roman Catholic priesthood, the sacrifice of the Mass. There was no gospel preaching. Now he continues, But we ordain ministers according to the command of Christ to preach the pure gospel and the Word of God, unquote. So in the Reformed Swedish Church, it was enacted that none should be ordained who did not approve themselves both able and willing to preach the gospel. Instead of putting into the hands of the newly ordained the chalice and the patent, now let me explain, the chalice is that golden cup in the Roman Catholic Church. Remember the woman that has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations of the filthiness of her fornication? That is the golden cup, the chalice, in which is supposed to be the blood of Christ that the, only the priest can drink. And, of course, the patent is the little gold-plated dish from which the priest serves to the people that piece of bread called the Eucharist. The body, they believe it is, they are taught from cradle to grave that that piece of bread is the body and blood and soul and divinity, Christ and Christ entire, that is to be eaten or sacrificed again on the Roman Catholic altar, and that through that sacrifice, Grace is infused. That's the salvation system of the great falling away, the Roman Catholic Church. But they were not priests. They were not sacrificing priests in the Protestant Reformation. They were preachers. 
they didn't make any sacrifices because they accepted that Jesus and Jesus alone was the sacrifice and that there was no more sacrifice for sin. All we are commanded to do is to receive the gospel. Now it says, but we ordain ministers according to the command of Christ to preach the pure gospel and the word of God. So in the Reformed Swedish Church, it was enacted that none should be ordained who did not approve themselves both able and willing to preach the gospel. Instead of putting into the hands of the newly ordained the chalice and the paten, in other words, the Eucharist, the sacrifice, the Reformers presented them with, quote, a little book, unquote, the New Testament, saying, quote, Take thou authority to read and preach the gospel, unquote. If a recovered Bible for the first and greatest, uh, if, if, if the recovered Bible be the first and greatest feature of the Reformation, most assuredly a renewal of gospel preaching stands next. But a third thing was also given to John in his representative character. In the vision, it was, quote, a reed like unto a rod, unquote, with which was to measure, quote, the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein, unquote, omitting or casting out the outer court, which was given up to the Gentile enemies who were treading down the holy city. In other words, the body of Christ. It was a measuring reed in the first place, but it looked like a rod of princely or ecclesiastical authority. Quote, a reed like a rod, unquote. This measuring of, quote, the temple of God, unquote, the symbol of the outward visible church in the world, and this command to define and measure out its boundaries and dimensions, including one portion and excluding another, looks like a direction to give attention and definition to the ecclesiastical foundations and boundaries or limits of the new Reformed churches, and to separate them in a formal public manner from the apostate church of Rome. Do you see now the New Testament predictions of the Protestant Reformation and how it should arrange itself and how it should oppose the great falling away, the Roman Catholic Church? That's part of the commission of a preacher of God's gospel, is to preach Christ and him crucified, and to preach against the counterfeit Christ in Rome. This should be clear in your mind now, what a responsible Christian is to do. Now, If Protestant Christianity owed its birth to the Bible and its early growth to revive gospel preaching, it owed its continued existence to its definite constitution as a separate ecclesiastical organization from Romanism. In other words, a permanent separation that the true body of Christ was to array itself against the false body of Christ in Rome. They should be two distinct people so that the world can judge the righteous from the wicked. We are to stand opposed to Rome, separate, never to be ecumenically reunited because we are not of that apostasy. We have been liberated. We've been liberated in Christ. And now our purpose in the world is to testify of Christ and to set ourselves apart, sanctify ourselves apart from the great apostasy in Rome. But what do we see today? The ecumenical movement, and not only the unification of the Protestant churches back under the authority of the beast in Rome, but the the gathering in of all the pagan religions of the world under the authority of the papacy. Common sense dictates 
that no one who has read and understood the gospel of Jesus Christ would ever subject themselves to the authority of the Antichrist of Rome. Now, continuing, he says, this came in due course. At first, the reformers had to attend to the core and kernel of the movement. Its spiritual side claimed all their efforts, a reformation of creed, of doctrine, of life and manners, of worship, of ordinances. All this came first, but there followed, and if the change was to be permanent, there had to follow something additional and of different character. When the child was born, it had to be dressed and named life first, organization afterwards. There had to come an embodiment of the new life in a new church organization and a definite separation from Rome. Don't forget a definite separation from Rome. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What fellowship hath Christ with Belial? There has to be a separation. Sanctify yourselves from Rome. Now it says, it was not merely that Rome on her part excommunicated and anathematized or damned those whom she called heretics. The reformers felt that they had a solemn duty to perform. They had to justify their own separation from the apostasy by a public denunciation of it as such. In other words, they had a duty, having understood the Scriptures, and the difference between that which was formerly called Christianity, which was now called Antichrist, they had to set themselves in array against that Antichrist system. He said they had to cast it out as any part of the true church of Christ. They had to constitute a new evangelical and Protestant church to provide it with schools and colleges, with ministers, services, and buildings, and all the outward requirements of a fully organized system of religion. This, accordingly, was the next stage of the Reformation movement, both in Germany and elsewhere. And this could not be done effectually without the concurrence of the governments of the respective countries. Now, why did this, why could not this separation take place, but without, without the help of the respective governments of the respective countries? They had to have the cooperation of the governments because formerly the governments were established by the papacy. They were, they were crowned by the Pope, and if they did not obey the Pope, they would be uncrowned by the Pope. And the Pope could order one nation to go to war against a heretic nation to bring them back under papal control. So when the Protestant Reformation broke out and the liberty of Christ began to grip the hearts and minds of the people, They had to have the cooperation of the government. They had to force their governments to separate themselves also from the Church of Rome. Otherwise, they had to be overthrown. And that should ring a bell to my listeners today. If, as I assert that the Vatican once again has control of our government, that for there to be a return to Bible Protestantism, the government of the United States, which now serves Rome, is going to have to break away from Rome. And I don't see that happening. At least not for a while. Now, continuing, if Romish authority was to be thrown off, if public property was to be converted to Protestant uses, 
if papal ordination was to be rejected and papal bishops refused, the governments must evidently take part and sanction the great change. Hence the need of the rod of authority, nor was it lacking when the time came for its use. I've not the time to trace the story. The elector John, assuming to himself, like our own Henry VIII, the supremacy of the church as a natural right of the crown, quote, exercised it with resolution and activity by forming new ecclesiastical constitutions modeled on the principles of the great reformer, unquote. Quote, come, let us build the wall that we be no more a reproach, unquote, said Nehemiah to the Jews. And so Luther and Melanchthon and other reformers urged the introduction into the reformed churches of new formularies of public worship, the appropriation of the ecclesiastical revenues to be the reformed parochial clergy and schools, and the ordination of a fresh supply of ministers independently of Rome. A general visitation of the churches was made by the prince's desire to see to the execution of the new system and complete what might be wanting to the establishment throughout Saxony of a separate evangelical church. Not an ecumenical evangelical church, a separate, non-Roman Catholic, Protestant church. In this feature, the Reformation differed from all the earlier movements of a kindred nature such as that of the Lollards in England or the Hussites in Bohemia. As Schlegel remarks in his Philosophy of History, quote, it was by the influence of Martin Luther acquired by asserting the king's authority as well as the sanction of the civil power that the Reformation was promoted and consolidated. Without this, Protestantism would have sunk into the lawless anarchy that marked the preceding the proceedings of the Hussites, unquote. This change took place in all the reformed states, the measuring reed, like a rod, being given by the civil authorities to the founders of the new communions that they might solidly construct them on a permanent basis. The outer court, representing the apostate church, they, on the other hand, formally cast out It was insisted on at the Diet of Augsburg that, quote, the Roman Pope, the Cardinals, and the clergy did not constitute the Church of Christ, though though there existed among them some that were real members of that church and opposed the reigning errors. That the true church consisted of none but the faithful who had the word of God and were by it sanctified and cleansed, while on the other hand, what Paul had predicted of Antichrist coming and sitting in the temple of God had had its fulfillment in the papacy, and that the Reformed churches were not guilty of schism in separating themselves from the Roman Catholic Church and casting out Romish superstitions, unquote. In his answer to the Pope, Martin Luther writes, quote, Rome has cut herself off from the universal church. If ye reform not, I and all that worship Christ do account your seat to be possessed and oppressed by Satan himself, to be the damned seat of Antichrist, which we will not be subject to nor incorporate with, but do detest and abhor the same. Unquote. That's proper language. That's language that be, should be heard in every Christ professing church in this land. But I maintain to you that if you go into any church in this land and utter those words, you will be asked unceremoniously to leave and you will be marked as an enemy of Christ. 
That's reality today. Martin Luther said to the Pope, quote, Rome, that is the Vatican, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, has cut herself off from the universal church. If you reform not, if you do not reform, I and all that worship Christ do account your seat to be possessed and oppressed by Satan himself, to be the damned seat of Antichrist, which we will not be subject to nor incorporate with, but do detest and abhor the same, unquote. That's what Martin Luther said to the Pope. You are Antichrist. You're not the vicar of Christ. You're the vicar of Satan. And it is our bounden moral duty to denounce you as such, to unincorporate with you and never return. We detest you. We denounce you. We abhor you as Christ's enemy. That's what Martin Luther said. That's what all the Protestant reformers said. To the man, every single one of them. No wonder they had unity. And no wonder God blessed them and blessed their work to the degree that even the governments of their countries were overthrown and became Protestant in nature. They renounced the authority of the Pope to dictate the rules of the laws of the land. And they gave the people liberty that the papacy never granted his subjects. They were one in Christ. And they were one against Antichrist. That's true ecumenism. That's true unity in the spirit. That is true unity with Christ. But where is it today? It's certainly not in the churches. Continuing, he says, this formal separation of the reformers from the apostate church of Rome and this formal organization of new churches holding evangelic faith and using a pure ritual is the fulfillment of this part of the symbolic prophecy of the Reformation. But we must not pause to justify this interpretation as a most important and interesting section of our subject uh, and our, an interesting section of our subject lies still before us. Thus far, we've seen that the Reformation is predicted as first the result of the action and interference on her behalf of the glorious head of the church, that it was produced instrumentally by a recovered Bible and by a renewed gospel testimony in all lands and that it issued in the development of a new ecclesiastical organization, a new church in the world, Christ Church, a retrospective narrative of the history of Christ's two witnesses is then given, which time forbids my full expounding now. These witnesses unquestionably represent the faithful evangelical churches, which held fast the gospel all through the dark ages of Roman apostasy. They are called candlesticks. And we are told in the first chapter of the book that candlesticks symbolize churches. They are also called olive trees. And this figure is used in Zechariah, where two such trees are seen supplying the candlestick with oil to represent faithful ministers. The double symbol seems to predict that all through the dark period of anti-Christian apostasy, that is, Roman Catholicism, 
faithful churches ministered to by faithful pastors should exist. They might be few and feeble, persecuted and hidden, small in numbers and inconspicuous in status, yet acting as Christ's faithful witnesses and holding forth the word of life, they would keep a light amid the darkness, the lamp of truth. The number two is used, apparently, in compliance with the law of testimony. Quote, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, unquote. These witnesses are not individuals, but churches, and their prophesying or preaching lasts all through the Dark Ages, through the entire period of papal domination, with the exception of one brief interval during which they are... <laughs> except through one brief interval during which they are, to all appearances, killed, extinct. In addition to witnessing for Christ and to his gospel, these evangelical churches would also witness against the Roman Antichrist and his assumptions. And the result would naturally be intense opposition on his part. When their testimony reached this point, he would make war with them until at last he would overcome and kill them. That is, he would silence their witness completely. He would so exterminate Bible Christians wherever they were found in Christendom by persecution unto death that as witnessing churches maintaining a public testimony to the truth, they would cease to exist. Individuals, of course, would still, like the 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed the knee to Baal, hold fast their integrity. But such would be the power of the oppressor that they would have to hide their heads and hold their peace in face of a mighty and triumphant and universal idolatry. This state of things would, however, be a very brief duration for at the end of three years and a half, the death-like silence would be broken. The voice of true testimony would once more be publicly heard. The witnessing churches would experience a wonderful and startling resurrection, which would greatly alarm the enemies, of, uh, the enemies who witnessed it. And instead of being oppressed and extinguished, the faithful churches would thenceforth be exalted and, ex and established. Such is the prediction of Revelation chapter 11, translated from symbolic into plain language. So, Revelation chapter 11 predicts the Protestant Reformation. Now, now, to those who are familiar with the church history of the Middle Ages, all this reads like history. It's a sketch from nature in which all the leading features of a well-known landscape are clearly discernible, though laid down only in small miniature. All came to pass precisely as here foretold. As superstition and apostasy darkened down over Christendom, and an ever-increasing multitude faith, faithlessly bowed the knee to Baal, as the man of sin gradually developed his power and his false pretensions at Rome. Protests arose here and there, and witnesses for Christ sprang up, whose records remain with us to this day. In the East, there were the Paulicians, who arose about the middle of the 7th century, and whom we know principally through the writings of their foes, who brand them as heretics. Already, even at this date, the priest withheld the testament from the laity as too mysterious for their comprehension, the comprehension of the common people. And a sort of paganized Christianity had begun to prevail when a man named Constantine who had come into possession of the Gospels and of the epistles of St. Paul and received their teachings into his heart, set himself, like the great apostle himself, 
to propagate the truth by extensive missionary labors. Now, I want to stop and assure you, this Constantine is not Constantine the Great of the old pagan Roman Empire. This Constantine is a true child of Almighty God, standing up against the darkness of Rome, having received the gospel and read it and comprehended it. Now, he pledged his followers to read no other book and hold no other doctrines than those of Scripture. And his 30 years of labor produced what his enemies called a sect but what seems to have been in reality a true Christian church. A persecuting edict was issued against it. Constantine himself was stoned to death. His successor burned alive and other leaders of the party. A subsequent president of the sect, one Sergius, writes, quote, from east to west and from north to south, I have run, preaching the gospel of Christ, and toiling with these my knees, unquote. In other words, he was in constant prayer, toiling with his knees, toiling upon his knees. His faithful ministry lasted for 34 years and tended to the large extension of the church, which was bitterly persecuted by the eastern emperors of Rome. He, too, sealed his testimony with his blood, urging his followers to, quote, resist not evil, unquote. The Empress Theodora slaughtered and drowned 100,000 of these Paulician Christians without extinguishing them. Her cruelties, however, last drove them to resistance, and they lost to some extent the purity and godliness which had marked their early days. They spread into, the, into Thrace and as far as Philippopolis, and even as last as the 12th century, it was found impossible to reconcile them to the Catholic Church. Look at the sacrifices those people made. In the West, confessors of Christ were similarly raised up in the early part of the 11th century, just when Gregory the Great, Antichrist Gregory the Great, was founding at Rome the distinctive system of Latin Christianity. Serenus, Bishop of Marseille, protested both by word and deed against image worship, one of the most characteristic features of the Roman Catholic Church. In the Great Council of Frankfurt in AD 794 under Charlemagne, a protest was made by the emperor and 300 bishops of the West in opposition to the popes on this subject of image worship. And the Council of Paris in AD 825 accompanied its decrees against the practice with an express rebuke to the Pope. In fact, the Gallican churches at this time held many views which should now be called Protestant in opposition to the doctrines already prevalent at Rome, such as the sufficiency of the Scriptures prayers in the vulgar tongue, that is, the native language of the people, the nature of the Eucharist. It's not a sacrifice. And the truth as to justification and repentance, the folly of relics and pretended miracles and other such practices. See, there were protesters long before the Protestant Reformation, God has always had his faithful witnesses throughout every age. Never in the history since Christ has there been absent a truthful witness for Christ. And what did they do characteristically? Every single one of them denounced the apostasy, the idolatry, the false Christian system of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what distinguishes God's true people from the counterfeits. He continues, Claude, the good bishop of Turin, has been called, quote, the Protestant of the West, unquote. He was a contemporary of Sergius, quote, the Protestant of the East, unquote, in the ninth century. He was a true 
fearless, enlightened witness for Christ, though men called him a heretic. He took Scripture as his guide and protested against all the Romish innovations. He delighted, like Augustine, to set forth Christ and divine grace through him as the all in all in man's salvation. Quote, with the utmost fullness, unreserved and precision, he asserted the great doctrine of man's forgiveness and justification in all ages through faith alone in Christ's merits and not any works of the law, ceremonial or moral, unquote. In other words, he condemned root and branch Roman Catholicism. Claude of Turin, though thus faithful, was not martyred, for the papacy had not at that time established its supremacy in Savoy. But he was sorely persecuted, and his prophesying or preaching was, quote, in sackcloth, unquote, like the emblematic witnesses. Quote, if the Lord had not helped me, they would have swallowed me up quick, he writes. They who see us do not only scoff, but point at us, unquote. His diocese was a wide one, and his influence great nor did it soon pass away. Traces of its effect may be found long after his departure. Faithful witnesses continue to hold and teach the truth as the corruptions around them increased. A sect who are mentioned by their enemies as prophets in the 10th century seem to have been spiritually descended from this good bishop of Turin and his sphere continued in papal estimation to be a hotbed of heretics. That's right, no matter where they are, no matter what they're called, God's true people, when they teach against the pretensions, the false antichrist pretensions of the papacy, and the apostasies, the idolatries, the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, they are always called heretics. That is a name that I do not shun. I'm glad to take my place with the rest of God's true people and to be called a heretic. Later on in the 11th and 12th centuries, we have numerous accounts of quote-unquote heretics who were brought before the Council of Orleans, Arras, Toulouse, Oxford and Lombers. The accounts still extant of the examination of these so called heretics show that so far from being such, they were men who witnessed a good confession and held fast the doctrines of the apostles. They denied all the distinctive teachings and practices of popery and were blameless and godly in their lives, even by the admission of their foes. Beringer, in the middle of the 11th century, was the founder of a fresh witnessing church, or, as his enemies put it, a fresh sect of heretics. He was principal of a public school, and afterwards archdeacon of Angers, and began by contending against the dogma of transubstantiation. Now remember, transubstantiation is that miracle that is performed by the Roman Catholic priest during the Mass where he takes the wafer of bread called the host and utters these insanely idolatrous words in Latin, hoc est corpus meus, and literally at that time, miraculously, they claim the substance of that wafer is changed from bread mere bread, flour and water, and a pinch of salt, and it becomes the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. That Jesus Christ, whole and entire, the living Christ, to be sacrificed again on the altar. Transubstantiation means the changing of the substance from bread to the body of Jesus. 
And from that point on, it's called the victim, the sacrificial victim. Now, this good Bible-believing Christian, this heretic, according to Rome, began to challenge this Roman Catholic dogma called transubstantiation. He was a brilliantly clever, learned, and good man, and much venerated by the people. His doctrines, of course, were condemned by the papal councils. He was deprived of his benefice. In other words, they took away his inheritance, all his wealth. But he had not the fortitude of a martyr and was at last driven to retract through fear. You see, Rome, once you challenge her idolatry, her blasphemies, her false doctrines, her false sacrifice, they'll put the fear of Satan in you. And this one, shameful to say, succumbed to that fear. Now, still, he employed poor scholars to disseminate his doctrine and died a penitent for his own want of courage and fidelity in A.D. 1088. Time would fail me to tell of Peter de Bois and his disciple Henry, the white field of his age and, and country, who after having almost overthrown the papal system in Languedoc and province, was seized, convicted, imprisoned, and some say burned of the heretics of Cologne in 1147, who, quote, bear the torment of the fire, not only with patience, but with joy and gladness, unquote. Of the 30 poor uh, Poplicani, as they were called, tried at Oxford in 1160, who, convicted of holding the truth of Christ and denying the errors of Rome, were, quote, branded on their foreheads beaten with rods before with uh, before the eyes of the populace, publicly scourged, and with the sound of whips, cast out of the city, unquote. A prohibition having been previously made that none should succor or help a sh- or shelter them, these poor persecuted witnesses for Jesus, whose garments had been cut down to the girdle, Though the weather was cold and inclement, perished in helpless wretchedness, yet singing, quote, Blessed are ye when men hate you and persecute you, unquote. Nor can I pause to speak of the Henricians, who were condemned in 1165 for their noble testimony to the truth and against the errors of the wolves in sheep's clothing who were called priests nor of others who formed links in the long chain of witnesses which extended from the 7th to the 12th centuries. One and all, they endured privations and suffering, which bear out the emblem of being clothed in sackcloth. And one and all, they exhibited self-denial, an unwearied zeal, and a degree of consistency and fortitude which show they were sustained by the power of Christ According to this prediction, quote, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy clothed in sackcloth, unquote. But I must pass on to the great witnessing church of the Waldenses. Would that I could tell its thrilling story. Read it for yourselves. It deserves to be restudied in these dangerous days of latitudinarianism, indifference to truth, and falsehood in doctrine. This far-famed quote-unquote sect, or true Church of Christ, arose in A.D. 1179. Some of its members were present at the Third Lateran Council with their books. Pope Alexander III showed them some, some favor but they and their writings were condemned and anathematized or damned by his successors, and persecution forthwith arose against them. They had a powerful missionary spirit, however, and their views soon spread in every direction, province, Languedoc, Aragon, Dauphine, and Lombardy, 
were speedily permeated with the gospel as preached by them, the Waldenses. Their doctrine, as illustrated in their ancient poem called, quote, the noble lesson, unquote, was scriptural and spiritual. And they protested against the Romish system as one of soul-destroying error, against the confessional, against purgatory, against masses for the dead and the assumption of power to forgive sin, and against the love of money which marked the whole system. They denounced the papacy as Antichrist in a separate treatise. These Waltenses united all their communities into the bond of one church, cultivated learning, eschewed mere ignorant fanaticism, and were filled with zeal and prudence. Their motto was, quote, the light shineth in darkness, unquote, and their symbol or crest, a lighted candle in a candlestick, the very symbol employed in this prediction of them and their fellow witnesses. But we must now recall that the prophecy not only presents the whole line of faithful witnesses as sufferers and mourners by the sackcloth emblem, but that it predicts that at a certain stage in their history, the Roman wild beast would in some special definite way make war against them, conquer them, and kill them. This part of the prophecy began to receive its fulfillment at the end of the 12th century, when at the Third Lateran Council dated 1179 A.D., the popedom roused itself collectively to a war of extermination against heretics. That's right, at the Third Lateran Council, it was stated that anybody who differed in their views from the Roman Catholic Church and the official teaching of the fathers of the Roman Catholic Church were ipso facto heretics, and that it became no longer a sin to kill a heretic, but that it was a meritorious work. In other words, Roman Catholics could receive another injection of grace, another infusion of grace, a special blessing from heaven, if they were to kill true Bible-believing Christians. And that's the, the basic characteristics of the Roman Catholic Church throughout its entire existence. She's drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. She's guilty of the blood of all the slain of the earth. The Bible confirms it. History bears witness to it. Who can argue with it? The Third Lateran Council marks the beginning of bloodthirsty persecution by the Roman Catholic Church against the true body of Christ. And it's still the law of that church. It is still the law of that church. It says, previously to this, separate members of the system acting alone and independently had opposed the truth by force and cruelty. But in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, Romanism, then in the plenitude of its power, gathered itself together for a great, determined, united, and persistent effort to crush out all that opposed its supremacy and to clear Christendom of heresy. This deadly onslaught against the saints was predicted. As you'll remember, both Daniel and John, in their four views of the Roman Antichrist, he was to wear out the saints of the Most High and prevail against them. Here, the same fierce and fatal antagonism comes in as an incident in the career of the two representative witnesses who symbolized the succession of evangelical churches, which kept up the testimony of Jesus during the Dark Ages. During the three centuries we've just mentioned, the furnace was heated seven times hotter than it was wanted to be heated. Persecution raised systematically. The Fourth Lateran Council, the one that succeeded the Third Lateran Council in 1215, sanctioned all former plans for the extirpation, that is, the annihilation of heresy, urged their adoption with renewed vigor 
and subordinated secular authority to spiritual powers for that purpose. In other words, the Fourth Lateran Council gave the governments of the world the responsibility to kill the heretics named by the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope, all he had to do was name who the heretics were, and the king of the land in which they lived, it became his responsibility to raise up a crusade against them and to extirpate and annihilate them out of the country. Now, I propose to you that the papacy is likewise in control of the government of the United States, and that when the Pope brings down the order to extirpate and annihilate the heretics, the true Bible-believing Christians from Protestant USA, the government of the United States will turn its most lethal weapons against us. If economic sanctions won't work, if economic collapse won't work, if denial of health care benefits won't work, if denial of, of retirement and Social Security benefits don't work, military force will be used, and you will pay for it not only with your dollars and your tax dollars, but your very lives. And it's nothing new. Rome has used this tactic since the Fourth Lateran Council. Henry Grattan Guinness continues, and if kings would not clear their dominions of heresy, their subjects, that is the Roman Catholic subjects of those kingdoms, were to be absolved of all allegiance to them. Crusades against heretics were to be organized and to secure the same privileges and rewards as crusades against the Turks. In other words, if the individual Roman Catholics have to take over the responsibility of the government to kill the heretics because the government won't do it, then they are promised by the papacy the booty of every heretic they kill. If you are determined by our government, or by the Pope, rather, to be a heretic, whatever Catholic kills you he gets a good share of your booty, your possessions, after you're dead. That's how Rome exterminated the heretics. That's the motivation. That was, it was all about money. It was all about greed. It was all about bettering one's position in society to kill a heretic and benefit financially from it. That's how they went to war. Their crusade operated against the Turks. When they joined the crusade and many of the popes uh, unleashed all the prisoners from prisons to go fight in these crusades, they had to swear that they would kill the heretic and for their obedience to the pope, they were given a portion of the bounty. I'm here to tell you, when this happens in this country, you will not be able to trust your own mother. And that's the horror of Rome. That's the history of Rome. That's the prophetic identity of the Antichrist of the Bible. And he says the Holy Scriptures were to be interdicted to the laity. They were to take the scriptures away from the people. Even children were to be forced to denounce their own relatives. That's right. If you are identified as a heretic by the papacy, and then, of course, the government's responsibility is to, is to identify you as a heretic, in the United States, they would call it a domestic terrorist, demonize you with that lie, then the public school systems will then take care of your children and separate your children from you because you're a heretic. That's the role that the public schools are going to take, to protect the children from their parents. The governments control the schools, and just like they did in the Dark Ages, the children were to be forced to denounce their own parents. That's what the schools do today. <laughs> 
That's the role that they are to play in this new world order, which is simply the reestablishment of the old world order that Henry Grattan Guinness is telling us about. I've gone a little over my time. It's, I'm going to give it over to Walt. My voice is beginning to crack already. I'll get a drink and I'll come back and uh, join the discussion. Thanks, Walt. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss. <laughs>